Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. It's certainly good to see you today. Continuing in our series on Back to the Future. This is part three of our, our sermon series. The first sermon, we just kind of did a, a basic overview of where we were and what was going on in, in the context of where we are now to where we're going to be in the future and how the Bible lays out this prophetic chart. So I, I put up this chart and I've taken a few things off of it till we get to those next parts next week. But it's talking about the end times where we are today in the, what we would call the church age since the incarnation and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his bride, the church. That takes us all the way through the time we're at now from the cross to right here and right now. In the near future, I do believe we'll see that, that ascending, of, of that glorious rapture when Jesus comes down. That's not the second coming, but he takes away the church. Now, a lot of people use the terminology rapture. That's a good term. It's not necessarily a Bible term, but the idea that it conveys is certainly it. There, that's from a Latin word, repar, which means to, to take something away or to snatch it away. But there is a violent snatching away and a taking away that the Bible does describe called the blessed hope. Also, when Paul says when the Lord comes for the saints, he'll appear in the air. It's not the second coming where he touches his feet on the planet. But he comes with the saints and the resurrected believers are brought up out of the graves. Then it says, we which are alive will also be caught up in, in the air to be with the Lord. That's when we ascend to the Father's house together. Meanwhile, back on the planet, back at the ranch, things are starting to fall apart. Uh, you can imagine the chaos and that will ensue a moment like that when millions upon millions of people are gone overnight. And a lot of the cemeteries need repairing. All right. Can you imagine the chaos? I mean, just, just think for a moment what happened at 9-11, the chaos and the global you know, mess that followed that event. You couldn't even get on an airplane for weeks to come. So you know, th that just be a kind of a, a mere shadowing of the tragedy and the calamity that's going to happen when the bride of Christ is taken off the planet and we get into glory with the Lord Jesus Christ and all things are left below. So we'll talk about that tribulation event and the millennial events and all those in the future, but still want to deal a little bit with the church age and what Jesus said it would be like during the church age. If you have your Bible, you can open it up or I have it on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 24 says, and Jesus came out from the temple and he was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple and the buildings to him. And he answered and he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. I was going to back up one quick second there. I think I got ahead of myself too quickly. And uh, verse three says, and he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them. I'm getting ahead of myself again and said, see that no one misleads you for many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ. They will mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened for these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and there will be earthquakes. But all these are just the, merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Remember last week, we talked about a little breakdown of, of how chapter 24 works. The disciples are enamored, obviously, by the buildings, and they're pointing them out, and Jesus said, hey, this is going to come down. In fact, they asked him three things when they got over to the Mount of Olives. And they're at a vantage point, sitting on the Mount of Olives. They see the Temple Mount and all that's going on there. And they said, what shall, when shall these things be in regard to the Temple? And the second question, what shall be the sign of your coming? And the third question, what should be the sign of the end of the age or the end of the world? And as we said last week, Jesus kind of wrapped it up and gave them three major areas to keep their eyes on. He said there'll be things that will be happening globally in the world. And then there's going to be things that, you know, happen in religion in the world. And he has quite a few verses on that through Matthew 24. And then he said there'll be, there'll be signs, you know, in the Middle East. And he talks about Israel specifically being the fig tree. Now, all of prophecy concerning the second coming of Jesus, all of them come back to this issue of Israel. And we're going to be talking about that in the near future. But last week we started with the wars and the global affairs. Remember, we said there are several things that happened. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, plagues, pestilence, earthquakes, you know, 
that we'll talk about today. We've dealt with the wars and the rumors of wars. Let's move to this next segment of global signs. And if time allows, we'll look at what's happening in the realm of religion that Jesus said would be taking place in his name. Really wouldn't be him, but it'd be in his name. And what else would be happening in the world? If we walk down this list in, in Luke, it says there'll be famines and pestilence. Here in Matthew, it talks about famines and plagues and, and earthquakes. But let's look at this first issue and think about it just for a moment. It's hard to consider this context of famine in the world when some of you probably ate too much for breakfast or some of you are going to go eat too much for lunch. You know, we might go to bed tonight with our, our, our tummies probably too full from eating way too much, but that is not the condition of the world. Remember, Jesus said these things would take place in various places in the world. And as he mentions the famines and the pestilence, the plagues, the earthquakes, you know, and the wars, all those he said would be happening in various places. Now, when the tribulation period begins, it's not be just happening in various places. All these signs are going to be global. I mean, it won't be a famine over there and a plague over there. It'll be famines and plagues and pestilence when the four horsemen of the apocalypse are loosed. But he talks about famines here. Again, in our country, with our, our contemporary culture, majority of Americans don't understand this concept, but there's a lot of people that go to bed hungry every night. In fact, they tell us there's about 13,000 babies that are born every hour in the population race. Then there's, out of the population, even with all these babies being born, they tell us that there's about 35,000 people that die every day in the world of starvation. This is not cancer, this is not AIDS, these are not the plagues. This is from famine alone. That's about 120 people a minute that die in the world hungry and die as a result of starvation. In some countries, they eat anything and everything. You know, they eat ants, they eat worms, they eat dogs. In some places in the world, they'll even eat each other. But 6% of the world's population is made up of Americans. But yet, containing only 6% of the world's population we consume over 50% of the world's food goods. So it gets a little difficult for some people to see, you know, that, that uh, starvation is so rampant in the world. In Asia, in Africa, in Latin American countries, well over 500 people are living in what the World Bank calls absolute poverty, not getting enough each day to eat. The World Health Organization uh, gave a, 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 a statement when they said one third of the world is well fed, one third of the world is underfed. One third of the world is starving. Currently, by the way, the number of underfed people is increasing dramatically every year. Famines, various places. And although we might not be that place, you know, there's still a lot of hunger in our, in our country and a lot of hunger in our communities, but it's, it's in be beyond understanding in so many other parts of the world. And he talks about plagues. Luke 21, 11 says in various places there'll be plagues and famines, all right? Not just famines, but now we have pestilence. We have, we have plagues. Obviously, we're living in a modern, very technological age and world. Modern science has discovered a lot of different medicines for a lot of different things. We would think with all the modern technology that we have that plagues would be a thing of the past. You know, we wouldn't deal with them. But pestilence, epidemics, plagues, Things like AIDS and cancer, they sweep across our nations at unheard of rate. According to the American Cancer Society, when you look at their statistics, they tell you in this year alone, they're expecting over half a million Americans to die from cancer. Keep in mind, that's not a global statistic. That is, a, that is an American statistic, meaning that the death toll globally is far higher than what we're seeing here. And we don't think of them that way. We, we, we watch the TV commercials. We see the endless barrage of money being raised for cancer research from every kind of cancer you can imagine. But yet we don't have any solutions. And we have no cure. Another problem is the AIDS issues, HIV virus. According to the youth age, the HIV virus, HIV virus will claim the lives of over close to 7,000 people. They say about, about 5,700 people die from the AIDS virus, not each year, every day. But yet we, again, we've raised multiples of billions of dollars to fight the AIDS and to fight cancer, but yet they're still prevalent everywhere you turn. Add to that the rapidly increasing appearing new strains of viruses and bacteria with previously unknown characteristics. And again, with all our technology and all our research, you know, you would have thought that most of these infectious diseases of the time that we're living in would be well behind us things being treatable. 
We've tried ever increasing arsenals of antibiotics and compounds of antibiotics and vaccines. They've been ingeniously contrived in medical laboratories across the world to cure these things, but they're having less efficiency daily. In fact, you realize back in the 1960s, medical students were, were uh, advised to avoid specializing in communicable diseases. Why? Because the, the idea in the 60s was, oh, this stuff will be a thing of the past. Well, they should have read their Bible, amen. <laughs> but it was an attitude that was shallow and an attitude that was unwarranted and it really was an attitude of arrogance because the Bible said it would be just the opposite. There's so many warnings in scriptures about this. We'll just, you know, and you look at what's going on in the world around us. Let me just name a few of the scourges that are, that are facing us in the world today. Tuberculosis, claim my own grandmother. Long been the scourge of man and was almost a thing of the past by 1980, but not so today. Not only are we seeing a resurgence in tuberculosis in different parts of the world, it's a highly resistant strain to the, to the medicines that were tried in the past. And it's ravaging certain prisons even and, and medical populations of the world. Add to that what we've already mentioned in regards to HIV and AIDS. Over 17 million people are infected with HIV virus worldwide. And there is no cure for AIDS anywhere in sight. They can fight it, they can battle it, they can slow it down, but they haven't stopped it. Another popular plague that seems to be making the rounds is what we call necrotizing fasciitis. It's brought on by a mutated streptococcus. It's called the flesh-eating bacteria. Now they say that you know, you've maybe recent years heard of this particular disease, and in recent years, they say if they can catch it within the first, uh, literally within the first hours, they might be able to save a patient from the widespread uh, wildfire that takes place in their body and destroys them. But only if they catch it within the first hours. Then there's a, a little known virus that, uh, that popped up and kind of went away. It was called Virus X. It rose from the primeval forest of, uh, of the Sudan, southern Sudan in 1993. And it killed literally thousands of people, you know. They, then all of a sudden, virus X just disappears. Nobody knows where it went. Nobody knows if it'll reappear. And when it does reappear, don't know how to treat it when it does return. And there's one you've all heard of probably in regard to the next virus. It's the, the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus is one that's, you know, nervously monitored by scientists around the world uh, because it's so lethal and so virulent. Add to that, you know, uh, the Junta virus, which is a pulmonary virus that attacks your, your lungs. And it, that's that virus that's spread by, by uh, rodents, feces and urine and saliva and all those things that are left behind by, by those little friends and, and rats and mice. That's the Junta virus. And, and, is especially lethal. They say, one report I read, it says uh, out of 99 cases, more than half of them ended in death. Add to that another one, the Legionnaire's disease. We hear about that kind of pops up here and disappears and pops up again, usually within confined areas like convention centers or cruise ships, you know, when people are confined together and certain environmental things happen within the HVAC systems and this virus is spread rapidly and kills a lot of people quickly. Then there's cholera, long thought over, but it's grown widespread ec epidemics in, in India now and also in Russia. Add to that, in Russia, there's also a continuing problem of diphtheria. Uh, again, that's due to poor sanitation and, and uh, the shortage of, of vaccines. Malaria, once thought pretty much done with in our hemisphere, is rapidly killing people all over the globe, especially in Central America. You have those problems. Malaria is caused by protozoans injected into your bloodstream is a result of, a, of a, a mosquito bite. We thought, well, this has been dealt with, but still causes a million deaths worldwide every year. A million people die from this. Smallpox. Oh, we've wiped out smallpox, but you realize that really smallpox only exists in a few laboratories around the world. And it's protected in these laboratories like in Atlanta, the Center for Disease Control. But there, there's great concern and continued debate over destroying those samples because it is highly sought after by terrorist groups and other countries that are militant to use it for chemical warfare. And so it could literally, you know, destroy millions of lives very quickly. So it's a danger as long as it exists in the world to be used in any kind of lethal form. It was back in the 14th century, I think I shared this before, when children, when the, you had the smallpox virus that killed millions of people across the country, uh, around the world, in the 14th century, it was a tremendous plague but people would carry around little pocketfuls of, of posies. 
in their pockets thinking that the fragrance would aid away, would push away the, vac- the, 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 the disease away from them. That's where that little song came up. Ring around the roses, pocket full of posies. Anybody know the rest? Ashes, ashes, we all, well, what is that? The ashes, ashes refer to the piles of bodies and how they would be burned to destroy the virus. And we laugh at that today. Say, well, that's stupid. You carry posies in your pocket and think you're going to avoid a virus like that that's killing people all around you. And they say, that's just ignorant. It's the same ignorance we've looked at back in the 1960s when Pete told people there really wasn't a need to, to talk about infectious diseases and communicable diseases anymore. Amen? So we're, we're facing major problems. Scientists all across the globe tell you how ineffective that, uh, you know, antibiotics become. That's why I don't even like to take antibiotics. Unless I just radically have to do it and can't take anything else. Because most of the time, if you go to the doctor and you got a little snotty nose, you got a little sneeze, you don't really need an antibiotic, but the doctor is going to give you an antibiotic. And what happens, you build up a resistance to the antibiotics, add it to whatever's been added to your food sources and food supplies. So there's going to be famines and there's going to be earthquakes, the Bible says, in various places. In the time of Christ, we only had three recorded earthquakes. In the 17th century, by then, there were about 500 earthquakes recorded. Now it's detected over 24,000 every year. And that's just from 2000 to 2007. Earthquakes are broken down into categories, you know, by Richter scale. And there's a new measurement now, but it pretty much breaks down like this. You know, the, the, the great earthquake is, it registers eight or more. The major earthquake is seven to 7.9 and so on as the list goes. The strong is six to 6.9. Earthquakes register six to 6.9. According to the United States Geological Survey, as long as we've been doing this in the late 1800s, they would call those great earthquakes and those major earthquakes many times killer quakes. 1890 to 1899, there were only one killer earthquake that was recorded and registered. In 1900 to 1919, a little 20 year window there in early 1900s, there were only three. You jump forward and starting from about 1950 all the way to the present day, it jumps from 1960s to 13, 1970s to 51, 1980s to 86, 1990s to 134, year 2000 to where we are now, over two to 300 of them, major earthquakes in various places. Now, during the tribulation, again, it won't be in various places. The globe is going to shake. The mountains across the globe are going to tremble. So you've had this exponential growth. And it's not just due to the fact that we can record these things. I mean, we've been writing about earthquakes. We're talking about not all those little seismic movers. You know, you've had in Oklahoma and you've had in Southeast Texas and North Texas and you've had them in Indonesia and Thailand and India all over the world. We're talking about these major shakers that destroy and take so many lives. Even recently, I mean, in the past 67 years, there have been substantially more great earthquakes than the prior 67 years. An increase in seismic activity, according to the Bible, is a prophetic sign. It's fulfillment of biblical prophecy. 50 most recent earthquakes took place from September the 28th, excuse me, yeah, September, uh, July the 28th to uh, September the 12th. 50 earthquakes, 32 of those earthquakes that happened in that little window of time just a month ago, we're 5.5 and higher in various places. Now, again, I, those are just a precursor. Remember, because Jesus said it'll be like a woman in travail. It'll be like birth pangs. There'll be some earthquakes and there'll be more earthquakes and there'll be more earthquakes and there'll be more earthquakes. It's the same thing with the famines. There's going to be famines and there's going to be more famine. And there's going to be more famine. With plagues, there's going to be plagues. There's going to be more plagues, more plagues. And the closer you get to the period of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to get to place then that it becomes global during the tribulation period. Another thing he said to watch in this particular signs of, in the world to watch. Remember, first was the global affairs. Now it's the signs in religion with false Christ and persecution and martyrdom. All these things are prophesied. Jesus answered and said, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will mislead many. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Verse 10 of that same chapter. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Verse 11, many false prophets will rise and mislead many. Verse 23, which I don't have on the screen, says this. If anyone says to you, behold, here's the Christ or there he is, don't believe them. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and they will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. In other words, we have a period of time from the church age when there's this great introduction of, 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 of false Christ. But towards the end of the church age, it's just rampant everywhere. And by the way, when it comes to false Christ, why do so many people believe these lies that are out there? 
Because when you refuse the truth of Jesus Christ, then you're susceptible to believe anything. You've opened your mind to deception and to delusions. The Bible says will come in the last times because people reject the love of the truth. The Bible says that God will allow, and not only allow, he will send a strong delusion so that people will believe a lie. That's another sermon we'll deal with. But the idea here is if you're going to reject Jesus, you're pretty much going to believe anything else. And you'll be deceived and easily deceived. That's why there's so much of the world is today because of our rejection of the gospel and of Christ. There's so much of the world is wide open for deceivers and false preachers and false prophets. It was estimated in the 1990s by Syracuse University, a professor, he did a research on contemporary religious situation in America. And he said at that time, in the 90s to the mid 90s, there were over 2,000 practicing gurus in America that referred to themselves as the Christ. Billy Graham alone said there were over 400 Christ imposters in Los Angeles alone. So that's, that's the world we're living in. Not, not even beginning to add to this point, Satan's favorite religion of humanism, which declares that you are God. Like the movie about Shirley MacLaine's life story where she stares into a, a pond and sees a reflection and she refers to herself as, hello, I'm God. The Bible makes it very clear. From Jesus' warnings to the apostles' warnings to what the prophet said, that in these last days we should test the spirits. In other words, we don't believe everything you see on TV. Don't believe everything you hear. No matter if it says Jesus Christ in front of it or not. You find out what the word says. You measure your, your life situations. You measure the teaching. You measure the doctrines that come out according to what does the Bible say. Paul wrote the church of Galatians. He said, I am fearful for you. This is the church. He said, lest you receive a false spirit and a false gospel and a false Christ. A little unholy trinity of a false spirit, a seducing spirit, of a, of a lying gospel that really wasn't the gospel. It was based on humanity and humanism and not upon the, the grace of God. A false Jesus. I think one of the worst things that happens to us in the culture that we've lived in, in the last hundred or so years is the movements of Jehovah Witness and the movement of the Mormons. Who pretend to be Christianity. And they're nowhere near Christianity. They have a semblance of Christianity, a little salt and a little sprinkling of some Bible verses. But they rewrite the scriptures. They deny the, the ultimate deity of Jesus Christ as the very truly only begotten son of God. Who pass off their religion, really not in the form of grace, but in works. If you do the works, then you will be, unless you, wish, you might be saved. Only 144,000, by the way. So... They perpetrate themselves as being truth when they're not the truth. Now, one thing you need to be aware of in the country today, and it's, it's ever increasing in America in, at, at an incredible rate where it's, not, where it's already rampant in the rest of the world. It has to do with persecution and even martyrdom. Do you realize that this century is known as the martyr century? Because more people have lost their lives for, Christ, for, for Christianity and for Jesus Christ since 1900 than all the previous centuries combined. Now, you, you think, about, think about that just for a moment. We're talking about the first century and all the, the death of so many believers and the persecution that takes place. We've seen far more people die for their faith in this generation than in past generations combined. In fact, the truth of the matter is, is that Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. The most persecuted. I mean, we, you should open your eyes and maybe listen to the news a little bit. Where whole cities in the Middle East are ravaged and, and destroyed and Christians are lined up and either drowned or beheaded or hung or burned alive for their faith and their commitment and their love for Jesus Christ. They watch their children die in front of them, trying to get them to renounce their faith. And even if they do renounce their faith, they go ahead and kill them anyway. Persecution on every hand. And yet so much of the church in the West just is, sits idly by. And refuses to make mention or to see it or to notice it or to pay attention. By the way, let me say this about persecution. It's not only just martyrdom, all right? It's discrimination. Many times in many parts of the world, it's slavery, it's torture, and eventually it's murder. According to a Helsinki International Federation for Human Rights, back in 1998, not that many years ago, he said even then, we talk about the civilized European countries, 19 European countries violate religious liberty. Now in this part of the world we're living in, coming to the Western world, there's such severe 
persecution and intolerance for the church of Jesus Christ like at no other time. We don't want Christianity in our schools. We don't want Christianity in our courts. We barely want it in our churches. This is the age that we've come to. You say, well, I really don't see it. Then you've become willfully blind and willfully ignorant to see what's going on here. A Christian who has a business in America no longer has the freedom as an American to practice that business and do that business as he sees fit. In other words, if I'm a Christian baker and a homosexual couple wants me to bake them a cake, then I've got to bake them a cake or risk fines and penalties and lawsuits and jail. But on the other hand, and this has been proven, if I'm an Islamic or a Muslim baker, I don't face the same scrutiny. I can reject that gay couple and there'll be no problem given to me whatsoever. Why? Because people hate the gospel. Because people hate Jesus. Because people, why would they hate Jesus? Because there's no other name whereby you can be saved. We don't want to follow. We don't want to surrender. We don't give our hearts to Christ. We don't want to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We want to be our own God. We want to live our own life. It's that mindset in this Western culture that says nobody can tell me what to do and nobody has a right to tell me what I'm going to do. But you don't understand that God created you for himself and you were created to have a relationship and fellowship with him and to live in the fullness of life. And you choose the shallowness and the emptiness of life over the fullness of life because you've been blinded by your sin. You don't see the truth. And so persecution is directed clearly towards Christians. And it's been, I think, since the, probably the mid-70s. I, I think it, it really began to peak in our nation with the Johnson Amendment that came out. When Lyndon Baines Johnson lost an election year one year, and he set out an amendment to our Constitution, which was ratified and agreed upon by our Congress, that says churches can no longer participate in the, relig- in, in the, the electoral process. The churches can't seek to influence anybody. Somebody ought to wake up. That's what the church is all about, influencing. We influence people for righteousness. We influence people for holiness. We influence people for Jesus. And that means every area of my life. I, I, I can't be dissected and put in boxes. I can't say, well, this is Joe Arms. He's the, here's the Christian Joe Arms. And, oh, here's Joe Arms. He's, he's, he works in the world. He's, he's a baker or he's a, or he's a plumber or, or he's a lawyer and, or whatever. He's a doctor, but that's separate from him. And over here, you know, you have, you have the, 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 you know, the, the out in the public social guy, Joe. No, you don't. I am a believer. You are a believer. We are what we are. When Jesus touched and changed our life, he changed our life. And now because of what I am, it affects everything else in my life. It affects the way I treat my family, the way I respond to my wife, the way I treat my children, the way I, the way I relate to other people in the community, the way I relate to my government. It's all on the premise that I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, I'm light and I'm salt. Now, I think it was so unconstitutional, it's, it's unbelievable because the very nature of our nation was founded on biblical principles and much of it was established due to the fact we had godly leaders. The whole of the American Revolution followed the Great Awakening. In other words, God sent a tremendous revival to this nation and as a result of it, we declared our independence so we could practice our freedoms and enjoy our liberties without government telling us what to do. But yet now we want to shut down anything that has to do with Jesus. And then Baines Johnson was so frustrated about losing that election, he had introduced the Johnson Amendment, which has been pretty much held up with. If you're an evangelical church, you better not have anything or any politicians in. You better not say anybody's name that you might support. Because you're going you're gonna to face the, the, the wrath of people for the American way. Which is not an American way at all. It's an anti-God way. It's a let's get rid of Jesus way. It's a let's get rid of the word of God. So we're living in this time of tremendous persecution. And so many Christians have their heads stuck in the proverbial sand. They won't pull it out and see what's going on. Amen? Add to that, what's going to happen in the world is this. Jesus said, you can, it works out this way. Right before I come back, there's going to be a major falling away. It's called apostasy. And apostasy means to fall back or to fall away. In other words, in the last days, because of the coldness and the lukewarmness of so many people, the Bible says in Matthew 24, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We have opened the door to such a cheap, shallow message of what it means to be Christians. There are people filling our churches today who have no idea what it means to be a believer. 
They have no idea what it means to be born again. Those terms of sanctification and salvation and regeneration and conversion, those are lost in the pulpit today. We just say, come as you are. Well, that's what the gospel says, but it says, come and repent. Come and follow Jesus. Come and surrender. We just want people to be comfortable, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it all has to do with this apostasy. The book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it is a descriptive time that describes how the men of God and how the Spirit of God worked in the first church. The book of Jude, the last book before the book of Revelation, it describes another time. It's called the Acts of the Apostates, not the Apostles. Whereas we see in the beginning, great movement of the Spirit of God towards the end, right before Jesus comes, you see a great number of people who have the name of Christ, but don't live for Christ. Who have the name of Jesus, but don't believe in the basic tenets of biblical doctrine, the blood sacrifice, the resurrection of Jesus, the virgin birth, the inerrancy of scripture. How many of you believe that today? How many of you really believe the Bible is truly the word of God? How do you believe the word is infallible? How do you believe that Jesus really is the only begotten son of God and that he became flesh? He was the God man and he lived a perfect life and he was crucified like a common sinner because he took your sins and my sins. He paid our price, which is the right righteous thing to believe. The Bible says by one man, sin entered into the world. That's Adam. And it goes on to say in Romans 5, but by one man's obedience, we can all be made righteous. So we trust in Christ. We believe the word of God. We believe the truth. But in the end times, the Bible says that people will depart from the faith. That's literally what it means. They are pretend. What, when the Jesus gave the illustration of the sower and, and the seed, when he cast out the seed, it says that the enemy came in and sowed weeds, another kind of seed, along with the wheat. Now, it was called tare in the Bible. And uh, it, it grows right along with the wheat. And it looks like wheat in the beginning. But the difference between the tare and the wheat is that when it gets to the time to bear the fruit of the grain, tare does not produce a fruit. It, does, it has no fruit. It has no head, which is Jesus. It's a pretend wheat. It has no substance. It doesn't do anything for it. It's just a weed in reality. And that's what's happened in our church. Now, Jesus said, don't worry about it. Just keep preaching the truth. I'll sort it all out when I come with the angels. We're going to pull the weeds. (laughs) I'll deal with the weeds. What he does, he pulls the wheat first, all right? And we're taken out of here. But what you have left is this apostate church and this false church that the book of Revelation talks about, this harlot. So the Bible talks about this, this great time of, of departure pretty much right immediately before the rapture. Listen to what 1 Timothy says. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. They'll pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. In 2 Timothy, it puts it this way. For the time will come when they will not endure you know, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and turn away the ears from the truth and be turned to fables. That's a powerful word of God. It tells us right before the time of Christ, you know, that people are not going to want sound doctrine. I can't tell you how many times I've been to a, to a conference where, of pastors and something would be said like this. You pastors don't need to be teaching people doctrine. It's boring. It's not what people need. It's not what people want to hear. They want to hear how to be happy. They want to know how to be successful. They want to know how to live a full life. Well, listen, the secret to happiness and the secret to a full life is the doctrine of the word of God. That's where we find out who God is. That's where we discover who we are. That's how we discover how we'll be saved. That's how we discover what it means for Jesus to come again. All these are found in scripture. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit who comes and we learn he's our comforter and we learn he's present. We learn he strengthens us. We learn he fills us. Doctrine is essential if we're going to go in grace. Jude brings this biblical climax of apostasy in in Jude 3. And he talks about how they deny the truths of the word of God. Listen, more than ever before, we're seeing mainline denominations deny the ministry of the Holy Spirit, deny the faith, deny the virgin birth, deny the resurrection, deny the blood atonement, deny the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew 24 says at that time, many will fall away and they'll betray one another. They'll even hate one another. And false prophets will arise and mislead many. So, Brother Joe, I just don't know if that's going on. Here's a a statistic I took in 1987, about 30 years ago, all right? Or more. It says here, they interviewed major denominations in America. And they asked these different denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, do you believe in the virgin birth? 
60% of the Methodists said no. 44% Episcopalians, no. 49% Presbyterians, no. 34% of Baptists, no. 19% of American Lutherans, no. 5% Missouri Synod Lutherans, no. Another question is, do you believe the Bible is inspired and inerrant and infallible? It's the word of God. It's practical in, 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 in truth and faith and history and secular matters that we should live our lives by. 80%, 87% of the Methodists at that time said no. 95% of the Episcopalians at that time, no. 82% of the Presbyterians, no. 67% of Baptists, no. 77% of American Lutherans, no. 24% of Missouri Synod Lutherans, no. Remember that verse a while ago we read? Let me read it from the New Living Translation. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires. They will look for teachers, preachers, who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. And they will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. That's the current age that we're living in. And Jesus prophesied all this, like birth pangs, increases in intensity as the time gets closer. I'll close with this verse in 1 Thessalonians 5. But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves perfectly know that that day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. Here we get back to this. As travail upon a woman the child and they shall not escape. The world's looking for answers, and they don't have any answers. People in great seats of authority across this globe live with great pessimism about what the future holds. As long as man is left to himself, he can never accomplish anything good. Jesus said, without me, you can't do anything. And we can't do anything righteous and anything good. It was Henry Kissinger who back in the 70s, 80s burst into tears in a camera interview and said, well, you know, one has to live with the inevitability of tragedy. The days are coming to an end. This fearful apostasy that we're talking about, it intensifies. The Bible says so much so, the church will be filled and loaded up with people who deny the basic tenets of the Christian faith. You say, Brother Joe, you're painting kind of a sad picture. And I'm painting a glad picture. I'm not sticking around, you know, for the demise. I'm headed for a greater celebration. That while the earth literally goes through seven years of judgment and the nations are judged and the unbelieving are judged. Yeah, people come to Christ at the loss of their life. But those who know Christ, when he comes for his church, they'll be received into glory. And it talks about a season of great praise. It talks about a time of judgment for believers to receive rewards. It talks about a great feast for the believers in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a lot to look forward to. Eternity. There's great hope in Jesus Christ. There's great. I tell you, folks, I have great hope in this life right now. I know that if everything goes to hell proverbially in the handbasket today, I got Jesus. If I face death today, I've got Jesus. They cart my body out of here and take me down to the local cemetery. I'm not there. I'm with Jesus. There's hope. It's the only hope. But understand this time of great grace and hope. God's been dealing with us this way for the last 2,000 plus years. And this time we call this church age has been grace, grace, amazing grace. God's grace, wonderful grace, all-sufficient grace, grace that teaches us, grace that leads us, grace that empowers us. God's been showing tremendous mercy, but the end of this age will manifest a direct intervention from God Almighty himself. And he will intervene and he will deal with the judgment of the wicked. I would say today to examine your own heart, to see where you are, because the last days describe kind of a, there's kind of a scenario. One, you see people who don't know Jesus. All right. And they, they gladly acknowledge it. I don't want him. Don't, 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 him, don't care. No. Him. And then you see, listen to me. Then you see a, a group of people who say they know Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus. You know, they, they, they came to church or they prayed to prayer or they were sprinkled or baptized or they were confirmed, but they never surrendered the will. The Bible says a man believes with his heart. If you want to be saved, all you have to do is believe with your heart. You give him your heart, which is the control. It's the very center of control for all of your life. I give you my heart, Jesus. You're in charge. 
I'm following you. You believe and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord. Gladly. But there's a group of people who, who don't have that kind of faith. It's all a head knowledge. They got the information down, but they've never experienced the transformation. All right? There's never been a regeneration. And they're part of this apostate group that becomes more obvious and more clear in the end of times. And they're left here to form that apostate church. And they gladly get a part of it because the Bible says this strong delusion comes. So we've got people who don't know Jesus and then people who think they do know Jesus but have never had a change in their life. And then you've got those people who do know Christ, the Lord is your Savior. Now, some of those are backslidden. Some of them are right with God. Jesus said, keep your eyes on the skies. He's coming again. He said, but understand, because sin will be so rampant, because iniquity will abound is the terminology was used. The love of many will grow cold. That agape love we have as believers, it has a tendency to grow cold. We have never been surrounded so much so like those words that Jesus describes, iniquity abounding, like at any other age like this age. With media, with social media, with the internet, with TV, communication, satellite, just beaming filth and trash and perversion, temptation. On every hand, we're called to sin. On every hand, we're called to get high. We're called to get drunk. We're called to party. We're called to live an adulterous life. We're called to be immoral. We're called to lie. We're called to cheat. It's all around us all the time. It's abounding. You have to guard yourself, as Scripture says. You have to guard yourself. You have to to be filled with the Holy Spirit each day. You have to surrender to the will of God. You have to be in the Word of God. You have to be a disciple if you want to survive. Or you'll be destroyed, even as a Christian in this age. Oh, you'll go to to heaven, but the Bible says, but so is by fire. Who wants to go out that way? Not me. I want to go out in glory. I want to die shouting. How about you? I want to die excited in Jesus. And whether it's I die this moment or I'm taken up there, hey, I still want to go out shouting either way. Hallelujah. We're not looking, as one old preacher said, for an undertaker. We're looking for an upper taker. That's the blessed hope that we look for as believers. Hallelujah. <laughs> Would you stand with me with your heads bowed? I'm going to be very clear this morning. Grace. Thank you for your word, Lord, that we're not living in this age in blindness. That you give us a clear map. Lord, you told us that we could be aware of the season before your coming. Help us not to be ignorant. And God, protect us from ourselves and this false idea that we can believe all the truth but not live it. Deliver us from the mindset, Father. As long as we acknowledge something in our head, it's okay. Help us to understand that everything transfers from our heart into living, living for you, trusting you, believing your word. We praise you and we thank you for your goodness to us. May you be glorified in our lives. May we be a people that are ready. May we be a church that's ready. Thank you, Jesus. Tell the Lord, thank you. Just worship for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody praise the Lord. God is good. You may be seated. There are a few things, two or three little things I want to remind you of. Some of you are aware if you're here every Sunday, but if you're not, this is your first time to be with us. I'll be out at the Welcome Center. I have a gift I'd like to give you. I want to thank you for coming and being part of our worship service and, and, and join, joining with us in praise and, and, our, and our time together. So don't make it your last time, obviously, but I do want to meet you personally. Don't, don't run out the door immediately. Step off to the right when you go into the lobby. I'll be out there. I'd love to meet you. Also, don't forget your tithes and your offerings. It's important. You know, uh, we just spent like $100,000 on updating the HVAC at, at this church. It took us about a year to do all the units. We got through all of them. So there's a lot more things in ministry that we're doing. A lot of that money could have been used in other areas, but unfortunately, we've got to keep things running, right? So uh, you were supportive of it. You gave extra to it. But hey, I encourage you to keep giving and keep honoring the Lord. There's a lot that the Lord has for us to do this year. We should be faithful in doing it. Amen? Can I get a, can I get a witness? Yeah. Amen. Now, some of you know that at our leadership banquet every year, we have what's called the Lyndon Ellis Faithful Servant Award, all right? Uh, This comes from an award that we share in in our church, in our leadership dinner every year. 
All right, and each year we get different people who've, who've exercised a, a genuine faith and a faithfulness to the Lord and just a humility in, in their service to the Lord. Many times they serve behind the scenes. You don't always see them, but they've been doing it. And, uh, you know, just so many faithful people, it's impossible to recognize everybody. We try to take a few each year that the Lord leads us. And it goes through a process of decision with not just me and the staff, but elders and others that are involved in this process over several weeks of just praying about what, what we shall do. Now, at the Magnolia Camp, we we gave those out when we had the leadership dinner the other night, and uh, there it was uh, Charlotte Sanders and then Terry and Deanna Colburn received that award for the Magnolia Campus. We didn't share it at the Spring Campus for a reason. Some of the people we were wanting to share it with were not present. All right, so I want to let the, I want to announce those leadership faithful servant awards right now. First and foremost, get to get my good eyes on Jackie Miller. Where are you? <laughs> you probably should have got this 25 years ago. <laughs> she wants to take your picture there. So. <laughs> we love you, sister. God bless you. Amen. She makes me cry. Larry and Tammy Jacquet are the others. Would you come? Larry and Tammy do so many things, so behind the scenes in so many areas, just like Jackie, serving in so many different secret places you never see them most of the time. Amen. You got to come over here. I'm going to get your picture right quick. Amen. <laughs> Bless you guys hard. I love you. You're such a blessing. Who, who holds up without breaking it? Smile at her right there right quick. Y'all give them another praise the Lord, would you? <laughs> Thanks, guys. I love y'all. Appreciate you. Amen. Amen. I know everybody here ought to get one, but next year.